Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. For quite some time now, the government is seeking parliamentary approval for a bill, but it is not happening, primarily because the government lacks majority in the Rajya Sabha. Multiple ordinances have been promulgated on the subject. There is a raging debate going on in this country on this particular issue. And we are talking about the Muslim women protection of rights on marriage bill, popularly known as the Triple Talaq Bill. In this video lecture, let us discuss all that you need to know regarding Triple Talaq Bill. But first up, the concept of marriage in Islam. Islam places a particular emphasis on marriage. In fact, marriage is a sacred institution in Islam. That is why celibacy or bachelorhood is discouraged in Islam. Islam says that marriage completes the faith of a Muslim. But at the same time, this marriage is also a contract, a contract between husband and the wife. And just like any other contract, this contract can also be broken. That means the divorce is allowed. But what are the Islamic ways of granting divorce? Let's have a brief understanding on that. The first one is divorce by mutual consent. Husband and wife married for some time. Now there are irretrievable differences between the two. And they both decide that let's mutually end this relationship. Let's end this contract and then the divorce is formalized. That means both husband as well as the wife, they mutually decide to separate from each other. They mutually decide to end this contract. And that is how the divorce is formalized. That means first, divorce by mutual consent. Second is Kula. And Kula is something which is initiated by the wife. It's important to understand that in Islam, the right to grant divorce is available only to the husband. This right is not available to the wife. Wife can only seek divorce. Wife cannot grant divorce. This power or this right to grant divorce in Islam is available only to the husband. So here, the wife is seeking divorce from the husband. If husband agrees, then the divorce is formalized. If husband does not agree, then what this wife can do, she can approach a Sharia court and Sharia court will then decide whether this legal contract will end or will continue. If the wife is not satisfied with the Sharia court as well, then she can approach the normal judiciary in this country. But it is important to understand that Khula is something which is initiated by the wife. If the husband agrees, the divorce is formalized. Why is this right to grant divorce available only to the husband and not to the wife? Let's not get into that because that's a separate matter altogether. We need to understand the concept of divorce. So first is divorce through mutual consent. Both husband and the wife, they agree to mutually separate from each other, to mutually terminate this legal contract and then the divorce is formalized. Second is Kula and Kula is something which is initiated by the wife. But wife cannot grant divorce. That power is available only to the husband. Then we have talaq. And there are three variants of talaq. Number one is talaq e hasan. What is this talaq e hasan? The husband pronounces talaq but only once. And then waits for 30 days. That means if the husband has to grant divorce to his wife, he says talaq once and then waits for 30 day period. What happens in these 30 days? Two things can happen. Number one, arbitration. Number two, reconciliation. What is arbitration here? If the husband has granted talaq to his wife, then the village elders can come into the picture. Family members can come into the picture and try and convince both sides, husband as well as the wife, that you look beautiful together. There are differences in every relationship, but you should move on and you should continue with this legal contract. There is no reason for you to separate from each other. Arbitration can take place. Reconciliation can also take place. Both husband and wife, they can mutually decide to reconcile all their differences. They can mutually decide that now we should give this relationship another chance. And during these 30 days, at any point in time, the husband can take this talaq back. That means this talaq is revocable. That means once the husband pronounces talaq on his wife, he waits for 30 day period. During this 30 day period, 
reconciliation can take place, arbitration can take place, and at any point in time, this talaq can be revoked by the husband. If it didn't happen, then say talaq again. And then wait for another 30 days. And another 30 day period is meant for reconciliation and arbitration. But if husband decides not to revoke this talaq, then he says talaq again, and at the end of the 90 day period, the divorce is formalized. That means what is the Islamic way of granting divorce? talaq e hasan What is talaq e hasan Husband pronounces talaq, then waits for 30 days. Husband pronounces talaq again, then waits for 30 days. Husband pronounces talaq again, waits for the 30 day period, after the 90 day period is over, then the talaq is guaranteed, the talaq is formalized. That means after 90 day period is over, the husband cannot revoke the talaq. That's talaq e hasan. Then we have talaq e ehsan, which is considered to be the most pure form of talaq. What is it? Husband pronounces talaq on his wife, but only once, and then waits for 90 days. During this 90 day period, again, reconciliation can take place, arbitration can take place. During this 90 day period, the husband can revoke talaq at any point in time. But once this 90 day period is over, the divorce is formalized. After that, you cannot revoke the talaq. The husband cannot revoke the talaq. That is what we call talaq e ehsan and talaq e hasan. Then there is another variant of talaq. And this is the bone of contention here. This is a very controversial one. Talaq e biddat. If you look at this word biddat, it comes from Arabic word bidda. And bidda means innovation. That means this form of talaq was not present at the time of the Prophet. This was innovated later on. And what is this talaq e biddat? Husband pronounces talaq on his wife three times in a single utterance. That means the husband says talaq, talaq, talaq three times in a single utterance and then the divorce is formalized. That means in this talaq e biddat, the husband need not wait for 90 day period. This talaq e biddat, it's called as instant triple talaq. That means instantly, when these three words are uttered by the husband, the divorce is formalized. You cannot revoke this talaq again. And it is this talaq e biddat which was in question before the Supreme Court. This form of talaq or instant triple talaq was considered to be discriminatory against the Muslim women. Talaq was given on WhatsApp, Skype, through a postal letter, on a phone call. And ultimately, if you look at this instant triple talaq, there is absolutely no scope for reconciliation as well as arbitration. But this form of talaq, it is banned in predominantly Muslim countries. Egypt, Bangladesh, Indonesia, many Gulf countries as well. If you look at the Islamic State of Pakistan, Pakistan banned this practice of instant triple talaq way back in the early 1960s, but not in India. Why? Vote bank politics. Purely vote bank politics. What is it? Whenever there was a talk that this form of discriminatory instant triple talaq should be banned in this country, the clerics belonging to the Muslim community, predominantly men, they would cry, Islam is in danger. They would advise the political parties, threaten the government that you should not interfere in our religious affairs. Because our religious affairs are guaranteed by the constitution, guaranteed by the fundamental rights, you should not interfere in our religious matters. That means although this instant triple talaq is discriminatory against the women, it is banned in majority of the Muslim countries in this world, but it was not banned in India primarily because of vote bank politics. Because these clerics, predominantly men, they would threaten the political parties, they would threaten the government that if you snatch this instant triple talaq, we are going to snatch votes from you. We are not going to vote for your particular political party. And it is because of this vote bank politics that this instant triple talaq could not be banned in this country. Then what happened? Few years ago, Shaira Banu along with four other Muslim women who were subjected to this instant triple talaq they approached the Supreme Court. They asked the Supreme Court that this instant triple talaq or talaq e biddat should be declared unconstitutional because it violates our fundamental rights. Supreme Court accepted this plea 
and Supreme Court set up a constitution bench. A five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court was set up to decide whether instant triple talaq should be banned, whether it should be declared unconstitutional or not. And the composition of the Supreme Court bench was also unique. There was a Muslim judge, a Hindu judge, a Parsi judge, a Christian judge, and this bench was headed by a Sikh Chief Justice of India. So this bench, a constitution bench of the Supreme Court, it was set up to decide upon the constitutionality of instant triple talaq. But ironically, this case, since it dealt with gender justice, Supreme Court was hearing a matter on gender justice, but there was no woman judge on this panel. But be that as it may, now these five judges had to decide whether instant triple talaq should continue or whether it should go. Now let's look at what Supreme Court said in 2017. Two judges, Chief Justice of India, Justice Keher and Justice Nazir. What they said? They said instant triple talaq cannot be banned. Why instant triple talaq cannot be banned? These two judges put the ball in the court of the parliament. These judges said parliament has the right to legislate. Parliament has the right to make laws. And if parliament decides to make a law and declare that instant triple talaq will no longer continue as the valid form of a divorce, we don't have an issue, but we are not going to ban it. Let parliament take a call. These two judges also said that religion is not a matter of logic. Religion is a matter of faith. So there are certain things in religion which you may consider irrational, illogical, but nevertheless they are part of the religion because religion is not a matter of logic. Religion is a matter of faith. In fact, these judges said something else as well. What these judges said? They said instant triple talaq is a part of Muslim personal law. Muslim personal law deals with Islam. Islam is a religion. Right to religion is a fundamental right. So by this logic, Muslim personal law is also a fundamental right. And it is for the first time perhaps in the history of independent India that personal laws were elevated to the status of fundamental rights. That means personal laws, which also talk about instant triple talaq, they were given same sanctity as that of the fundamental rights. So two judges are clearly saying that we are not going to ban instant triple talaq, let parliament take a call. But what these two judges said, they said we are going to impose a stay on this practice of instant triple talaq for a period of six months. So there are six months available with the parliament. Let parliament take a call, enact a law within this period of six months and decide whether instant triple talaq should continue or whether it should go. So two judges are clearly not in favor of declaring instant triple talaq unconstitutional. What about two other judges? Justice Rohintan Fali Nariman and Justice Yu Yu Lalit. What these two judges said? They said instant triple talaq is unconstitutional. Why is it unconstitutional? These two judges said that even if there is a law which was passed prior to the commencement of the constitution. Our constitution got enacted in the year 1950. Muslim personal law was passed in the year 1937. Supreme Court judges said that even if there is a pre-constitutional law, but even this pre-constitutional law must conform, must be in agreement with the constitution. And if any such law is in violation of the fundamental rights guaranteed by the constitution of 1950, we are going to declare such a law as unconstitutional. These two judges said, since instant triple talaq is arbitrary, without any application of logic, since instant triple talaq is arbitrary, violating the constitutional rights, violating the fundamental rights of the Muslim women, that means it violates Article 14 of the Constitution of India, which is right to equality. Supreme Court said right to equality also includes right against arbitrariness. And since instant triple talaq is arbitrary, arbitrarily employed by the Muslim men, Muslim husbands, that is why instant triple talaq is unconstitutional. Now two judges, 
ट्रिपल तलाक के नॉट बी डिक्लेयर अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल टू जजेस ट्रिपल तलाक और इंस्टेंट ट्रिपल तलाक इज अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल ना वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड वॉट डिड द फिफ्थ जज ऑन द बेंच से द फिफ्थ जज जस्टिस कुरियन जोजफ जस्टिस कुरियन जोजफ सेड इंस्टेंट ट्रिपल तलाक इज अन इस्लामिक वाई इज इट अन इस्लामिक कुरियन जोजफ सेड दैट इन इस्लाम there is a provision for granting divorce talaq but there are two prerequisites for that any form of talaq must include two things number 1 reconciliation number 2 arbitration but in this form of instant triple talaq there is absolutely no scope for reconciliation there is absolutely no scope for arbitration because this type of talaq is irrevocable once instant triple talaq is given you cannot revoke it and since it violates two prerequisites two conditions which is arbitration and reconciliation which is an integral part of divorce in islam that is why instant triple talaq or talaq e bidat is un islamic that means by the majority of 3 is to 2 two judges they decide to not interfere in instant triple talaq three judges they decide that this instant triple talaq should not continue but the reasons given were different these two judges said it is unconstitutional korean joseph says it is un islamic that means by the majority of 3 is to 2 instant triple talaq is set aside that means it is no longer a valid form of divorce it was not declared unconstitutional because only two judges said it is unconstitutional it was only set aside because the majority judges felt that instant triple talaq should not continue but for different reasons two judges said because it is unconstitutional it should not continue one judge said because it is un islamic that is why it should not continue and that is how in 2017 the supreme court ruled that instant triple talaq is set aside that means even if the husband pronounces instant triple talaq on his wife it will not lead to divorce because the marriage is still valid but even after the 2017 verdict the government said that the supreme court order is being flouted the government said that we have come across more than 60 some reports said more than 250 instances where instant triple talaq has been pronounced by husbands on their wives that is why there is a need for a law so that this law can punish those husbands who violate the supreme court order who subject their wives to harassment by pronouncing instant triple talaq that is why the need for a law was felt and last year also the government tried to bring in a bill in the parliament it was passed in lok sabha but it failed to get the nod of the rajya sabha because the government does not enjoy majority in rajya sabha then ordinance was promulgated then another ordinance was promulgated and now there is a bill pending in the rajya sabha this muslim women protection of rights on marriage bill 2019 we'll have to wait and watch whether it will be passed in rajya sabha or not but now let's understand some of the provisions of this bill then we will critically analyze this bill we will look at the arguments of those who criticize this bill and then see whether these arguments are justified or not first up let's look at the provisions of this bill provision number 1 the offense and penalty this bill makes declaration of talaq a cognizable offense and a husband can be subjected to 3 years in jail along with a fine but what is a cognizable offense broadly offenses are either cognizable or non cognizable if an offense is cognizable then the police can arrest the accused without a warrant issued by the magistrate that means if an individual has committed an act and this act is a cognizable offense then the police does not require the warrant issued by the magistrate even in absence of a warrant issued by the magistrate this individual can be arrested that means if the husband pronounces instant triple talaq on his wife this act is a cognizable offense that means the police can arrest this husband without any warrant issued by the magistrate there are other offenses which we call non cognizable offenses for example defamation if you defame me would you be arrested yes but for that 
the magistrate has to issue a warrant. In absence of this warrant issued by the magistrate, the police cannot arrest you. That means offenses are broadly of two types, cognizable offenses and non-cognizable offenses. But instant triple talaq has been classified as a cognizable offense. That means even in absence of a warrant issued by the magistrate, the husband can be arrested. And if it is proven that this husband indeed has pronounced instant triple talaq on his wife, he will be subjected to three years in jail along with a fine. But who can file this complaint? This can be relevant for your prelims examination. Only the wife or the married woman against whom the talaq has been declared, only she can file this complaint or any person related to her by blood or marriage can file this case. To prevent the misuse of this law, now the bill has made it clear that only the married woman against whom the talaq has been declared, only she can file this complaint or someone who is related to her either by blood or marriage can file this case. That means instant triple talaq pronouncement is a cognizable offense. If proven, the husband can be put behind bars for a period of three years along with the fine. That's number one. Number two, bail. Way back in 1970s, Justice V. R. Krishna Iyer, along with Justice P. N. Bhagwati, they made a categorical statement wherein they said that jail is an exception, bail is a norm. What does that mean? That means as much as possible, release the accused on bail. Jail is only an exception. Under which circumstance? If the accused can tamper with the evidence, if the accused can threaten the witnesses, if the accused can run away from this country, only in these instances should an accused be sent behind the bar. In all other cases, the accused should be released on bail. Previous versions of this bill considered that no bail should be given to the husband who is accused of pronouncing instant triple talaq. But now this new bill, which is pending in the Rajya Sabha, it has a provision for bail, that means this bill has incorporated the ruling of the Supreme Court way back in 1978, wherein the Supreme Court said, jail is an exception, bail is the norm. Now the bail can be granted to the husband by the magistrate. But for that, the magistrate has to hear the woman as well. Without hearing the woman, the magistrate cannot release the husband on bail. But bail is present in the bill. Let's look at another provision. Compoundable offense. Offenses can further be classified into two. Some offenses are compoundable. Other offenses of heinous nature are non-compoundable offenses. What is a compoundable offense? For example, there is a dispute between you and me. You have filed a case before the court of law. And even before the case is heard, you and me can settle this matter. You and me can settle this dispute. And then you can withdraw this case from the judiciary. That means this is something called compoundable offense. And in this case, if the instant triple talaq is pronounced by the husband on his wife, and then the wife has filed a complaint before the police, there is a case pending before the court of law, there can be a settlement between the husband and the wife. And then the wife can withdraw this case from the judiciary, which means this offense is compoundable. But there are other offenses which are not compoundable. There are offenses of heinous nature, for example, rape, for example, murder, where punishment should be given to the offender, punishment should be meted out to the accused. Those offenses are what we call non-compoundable offenses. This can be another potential statement for your prelims examination. Instant triple talaq, the offense may be compounded by the magistrate upon the request of the woman against whom the talaq has been declared. That's another provision of this bill. Let's look at two more provisions. Number one, allowance. If the husband has pronounced instant triple talaq on his wife, the magistrate will decide upon the allowance as well. The husband has to grant allowance for her dependent children as well. And this amount of allowance will be determined by the magistrate. One more provision, custody. The Muslim women against whom such talaq has been declared and which type of talaq are we talking about? Instant triple talaq. All other forms of talaq are still valid. That means whether it is divorced through mutual consent, khulla, talaq-e-ehsan, talaq-e-hasan, they're still valid. 
But this talaq e biddat or instant triple talaq, if this instant triple talaq is pronounced by the husband on his wife, this Muslim woman can seek the custody of her minor children as well. And the manner of custody will be determined by the magistrate. So these are some of the important provisions of this triple talaq bill or the bill of 2019. So what are we talking about? Let's recap a bit. We are talking about a bill called triple talaq bill. For that to understand, we first need to understand the concept of marriage in Islam that we have done. Then we talked about various forms of divorce that are allowed in Islam. We talked about this talaq e biddat or this instant triple talaq which was considered discriminatory against the Muslim women. And in 2017, we talked about the judgment of 2017. Supreme Court said this instant triple talaq is set aside. It was not declared unconstitutional. It was set aside. Then we talked about what was the need for a law. Despite the Supreme Court ruling of 2017, there were repeated violations of the Supreme Court order. That is why the government felt that for the larger interest of gender justice in this country, for the larger justice of the Muslim women in this country, we need a law so that we can punish those husbands who violate the Supreme Court order. And that is how a bill was introduced in the parliament. And now this 2019 bill is pending before the Rajya Sabha and we'll have to wait and watch whether this bill will be passed or not. But then we looked at various important provisions of this bill. But now let's critically analyze all these provisions mentioned in the bill one by one. So we will take up the arguments of those who criticize this bill. The first argument, what conduct becomes crime? It's important for you to understand the difference between a civil wrong and a criminal wrong. A civil wrong is a dispute between two individuals. For example, you and me, we are having a dispute over a piece of land, over some property. That's a dispute between two individuals. And that is what we call a civil wrong or civil case. In civil cases, there are two parties involved. You and me, two sets of individuals, they're fighting a particular case. And ultimately, this case is what we call a civil case. If you look at a criminal case or a criminal wrong, it's also a dispute between two individuals, but of a serious nature. And of a serious nature, which can threaten the society as well. How? Let's say, for example, there is a terrorist. Terrorist is killing few individuals. Isn't it a dispute between two individuals? Because there is a terrorist who is killing some other individual, it is normally a dispute between these individuals and the terrorist. But terrorism is an act of offense against the state. Terrorism is waging war against the country. That is why in criminal cases, there are two parties also. First is defense, the other is prosecution. And prosecution in this case is the state. That means although criminal case is also a dispute between two individuals, but the state is the other party in this case. That means the other party in this case, in a criminal case, is the state of India or the Union of India. Let's look at other cases of criminal wrongs. For example, rape, murder, dacoity. Yes, these are also offenses committed by individuals against other individuals. For example, a man is raping a woman. A man is killing another man. A man is robbing another man. It is also a matter of dispute between two individuals. But this act has the potential of harming the society. This act of rape, murder, dacoity has the potential of disrupting the normal life of the people. That is why John Stuart Mill, in his philosophical work on liberty, he talked about a principle called harm principle. That means only those offenses should be declared as crimes if they have the potential of harming others, if they have the potential of harming the society. Critics argue, how does instant triple talaq sit on this principle called harm principle? Because let's say, for example, there is a husband, he pronounces instant triple talaq on his wife. He says talaq, talaq, talaq. But does it lead to divorce? No. Why? Because in 2017, Supreme Court said instant triple talaq is set aside. That means whether you pronounce talaq three times or 30 times, 300 times, 3 lakh times, 3 crore times, even then it won't lead to divorce 
because marriage is still valid. That means when instant triple talaq does not lead to divorce, how is it harming the woman? When it is not harming the woman, so why should you declare instant triple talaq as a crime? So that is why there are critics who say instant triple talaq at best is a civil wrong, a dispute between the husband and the wife. You cannot declare this instant triple talaq, which is a dispute between two individuals as a crime. And it violates the harm principle given by John Stuart Mill. That's one argument against this instant triple talaq bill. Let's look at another argument. Was there a need for a law? When government came up with this bill for the first time, they said that 2017 judgment, two judges of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice of India and Justice Nazir, they said that let parliament enact a law and declare whether instant triple talaq should continue or not. So since two judges of the Supreme Court in 2017 stated that parliament should take a call, parliament should enact a law, that is why we are enacting a law, that is why this bill should be passed by the parliament. So we are only obliging the Supreme Court ruling. But the critics argue, is there a need for a law? Why? When in 2017, Supreme Court ruled that instant triple talaq is set aside, under Article 141 of the Constitution of India, it becomes the law of the land. That means any order issued by the Supreme Court, any verdict issued by the Supreme Court, any ruling issued by the Supreme Court, it becomes the law of the land under Article 141 of the Constitution of India. So if the law of the land is settled, that instant triple talaq is set aside. If a husband pronounces instant triple talaq on his wife, it does not lead to the annulment of the marriage. The marriage is still valid. So why is there a need for a law? And that is why critics argue that this bill violates the theory of Montesquieu as well. Montesquieu, French philosopher, wrote, There is no greater tyranny than that which is perpetrated under the shield of the law and in the name of the justice. So basically to paraphrase this statement, Montesquieu is saying that if there is no need for a law, but then the parliament enacts a law, it is tyranny. It's an unjust rule. So if under Article 141, the Supreme Court ruling made it clear that instant triple talaq is set aside, it becomes the law of the land, why is there a need to pass another law on the same subject? So it is tyranny according to the critics. Now there can be a question on your mind, that despite the fact that in 2017 Supreme Court said instant triple talaq is set aside, even if the husband is pronouncing instant triple talaq on his wife, you should punish this husband. You can still do that without bringing in another law. How? Contempt of court. If there is a husband who despite the Supreme Court ruling is pronouncing instant triple talaq on his wife and the government says to punish this husband we need a law, you don't need a law to punish this individual. Because this individual can be punished because of contempt of court as well. Because he is committing contempt of court. So there was no need for a law, according to critics. Then let's look at another argument. It's a very important argument. Mens re. In criminal cases, mens re is very important. Or that's what we call guilty intention. And I will make it simpler for you. For example, you and me, we are walking on the road. We are exchanging pleasantries. We are discussing something. And suddenly I pushed you, unintentionally, but I pushed you. And you came under a speeding car and you're dead. Will I be punished for murder? No, because what was my intention? My intention was not to push you so that you can come under the speeding car and you will get killed. That was not my intention. So I will not be punished for murder. That means in criminal cases, intention or guilty intention is of very, very important significance. Mens re. Here is a husband who is pronouncing instant triple talaq on his wife. Is his intention to grant divorce to his wife? No. Why? Because whether he says instant triple talaq three times or 300 crore times, it is still not going to lead to divorce. So when it is not leading to divorce, why are you punishing this individual for divorce? So basically, if we consider men's free, instant triple talaq should not have been declared a crime. That's another argument according to the critics, which is why they oppose this bill. Then let's look at another argument. 
presumption of innocence and the burden of proof. Let's say for example, there is an individual E. He is accused of a crime. He is an accused. Will he be punished by the judiciary? Yes. But under criminal justice system in this country or for that matter anywhere in the world, there are two things important. One is presumption of innocence. That means whenever an accused is brought before the judiciary, the judiciary assumes that this individual is innocent. Then what happens? The prosecution, the state has to prove that this individual is guilty. The state, the prosecution has to prove that this accused is in fact an offender, a criminal. And that is when the judiciary pronounces verdict on this individual and sentences him to jail or to death. That means in criminal justice system, there is always something called presumption of innocence. The burden of proof is on the state to convince the judiciary that this individual is guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. Look what can happen in this instant triple talaq case. The husband pronounces instant triple talaq on his wife. Wife files a complaint before the police. The case is before the judiciary. How can this wife prove beyond any reasonable doubt that this gentleman, this husband pronounced instant triple talaq on his wife? If this instant triple talaq was pronounced through WhatsApp, through Skype, maybe there can be recordings of that. But if it is an oral pronouncement of instant triple talaq, how can the prosecution, how can the state prove beyond any reasonable doubt that this individual pronounced instant triple talaq on his wife? Because it will become very difficult for the prosecution to prove the guilt of this husband beyond any reasonable doubt. There are critics who also say that the punishment of three years is disproportionate. That means a husband pronouncing instant triple talaq on his wife will be sentenced behind bars for three years. It is disproportionate. Why? Look at the punishment scheme under the Indian Penal Code. We have an Indian Penal Code. It lists down various punishments for various offenses, for various crimes. Let's look at this punishment scheme. For sedition, it is life imprisonment as well as three years. That means what are the crimes under Indian Penal Code which has three years imprisonment? There is sedition. If you are booked for sedition, you can be sentenced to life imprisonment as well as to three years. For malicious insulting of religion or religious beliefs of any class, three years. For rioting armed with deadly weapon, three years. And now these are very serious offenses. These are very serious crimes. And now you are equating all these serious crimes with instant triple talaq. What does that mean? That means instant triple talaq is in no way comparable to these offenses under Indian Penal Code for which the punishment is the same three years. Because what is happening here? The husband, instead of following the normal route of divorce, where the husband has to wait for 90 days, instead of waiting for 90 days, he pronounces instant triple talaq and he says that this marriage should get dissolved in an instant. That means you are comparing this individual who has pronounced instant triple talaq on his wife and you are comparing this offense with the offenses such as sedition, such as rioting that to armed, such as malicious insulting of religion or religious beliefs. Critics say that instant triple talaq pronouncement can in no way be compared with these offenses. But let's look at another punishment scheme under Indian Penal Code. Causing death by a rash and negligent act. Imprisonment of two years only. Bribery. Imprisonment for one year. Destroying, damaging or defiling a place of worship. Imprisonment for two years. Causing public nuisance. Fine of rupees 200. So that means under this instant triple talaq bill, you are saying that these offenses are lesser offenses than instant triple talaq. That is why critics argue that this punishment for a husband who pronounces instant triple talaq on his wife, it is disproportionate. You can't be sentencing an individual for up to three years in jail if this individual has committed a far lesser an act, far lesser a crime than these crimes. That is why critics argue that this punishment scheme is unjustifiable, it is also disproportionate. The critics also argue that because of this bill, 
something else can happen. So there will be an unintended consequence of this bill. Why? If you look at a particular bill, it has some intended consequences. It has some unintended consequences as well. This instant triple talaq bill, the government intends that the consequence will be that arbitrarily the husband will not divorce his wife. Husband has to follow a particular guideline. Husband has to follow a non-discriminatory method to grant divorce to his wife. This is an intended consequence. That is what the government tries to achieve through this bill. But critics argue there can be an unintended consequence because of this bill. For the fear of prosecution, the husband, because he fears prosecution under this law, what he will do? He will not grant divorce. Instead, what he will do? He will abandon his wife. Just like many Hindus are doing. They are simply abandoning them. That is what critics fear would happen to Muslim women as well. They would be simply abandoned by their husbands. That is going to be an unintended consequence because of this bill. But let's end this discussion with a note written by Fazan Mustafa, who is the Vice Chancellor of Nalsar University of Law in Hyderabad. What he says, no social law can really succeed in solving social problems. Triple talaq is a social problem. The government says that since instant triple talaq judgment of the Supreme Court 2017 was violated by the people, was violated by the Muslim men, that is why we need a law. But look at what is happening at the Sabri Malai. A five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court had to decide whether women of menstruating age between 10 to 50, whether they can enter the inner sanctum sanctorum of the Sabri Malai temple in Kerala. By the majority verdict, four judges of the Supreme Court said women of all age groups must pray at the Sabri Malai. And even after this verdict, we have seen protests in Kerala where openly people in Kerala are protesting against this verdict, are openly deciding that we are not going to follow the Supreme Court verdict. Does that mean that tomorrow the government should bring in a law and declare all those protesters as criminals because they are violating, not obeying the Supreme Court order? Because what is required, the Supreme Court ruling, or for that matter, any law, there has to be legal awareness. Maybe there are individuals who pronounced instant triple talaq on their wives. Maybe they were not knowing that there is a Supreme Court ruling which has set instant triple talaq aside. That means instead of a law, we require legal awareness. To create an awareness amongst the Muslim community that instant triple talaq is not a valid form of divorce. That means we can't be making laws just because there have been violations. That's number one. Number two, when this instant triple talaq bill talks about allowance or compensation that the husband has to pay to his wife. But look at it this way. This form of talaq is prevalent amongst the lower strata in the Muslim community. Because only in lower strata of the Muslim community do we find instances of instant triple talaq or talaq e bidat. Then the husband would be sent to jail. But then this husband has to provide compensation or allowance to his wife as well as his dependent children. How can this individual provide compensation to his wife when he is in jail? When the husband is in jail for three years, which means he cannot earn in these three years, how can he provide compensation to his wife? How can he provide allowance to his dependent children? That means there are some provisions in this bill which are unimplementable. That's number one. Number two. This bill also talks about custody of children, custody of minor children, which will be determined by the magistrate. But when do we normally talk about the custody of children? At the time of divorce. At the time of divorce, the magistrate has to decide, has to rule whether the minor children will go with the mother or with the father. But if you are saying instant triple talaq does not lead to divorce, that means even if the husband is pronouncing instant triple talaq on his wife, the marriage is still valid, the marriage is still legal, that means it does not lead to divorce. Why are we talking about custody of children? That means there are some inconsistencies within the bill as well. That's what Fazan Mustafa writes. He says no social law can really succeed in solving social problems. 
law is not a great agent of social control. Because Fazan Mustafa questions, haven't the laws related to dowry, related to child marriage, haven't these laws failed? That means no law can really succeed in solving social problems. We need to create awareness for that. That is what Fazan Mustafa writes. Fazan Mustafa also argues that we need to remove the stigma which is attached to divorce. That means ideally, divorce should not be treated as the end of the world for divorcees. They should be encouraged. They should be encouraged. The divorcees should be encouraged to continue with their lives. We need to encourage the women that you can survive even without a man. There is no need to over empathize with this institution called marriage. Marriage is a contract. It's a civil contract between two individuals. And just like any other contract, this contract can also be terminated. We should remove the stigma which is attached to divorce. That is what you need to understand from this issue, Triple Talaq Bill. Thank you for watching.